Hi. In this quick take, I want to go over a new pronouncement of guidance from uh, the superintendent of the New York Division of Financial Services, Adrian A. Harris. Uh, this is a consumer protection guidance that was released in the wake of a lot of the insolvency uh, or bankruptcy issues of a number of these uh, crypto um, native crypto entities. Uh, and so press release came out here on the 23rd, uh, superintendent releases consumer protection guidance in the event of virtual currency insolvency. So this is the press release uh, that's available at the DFS uh, ny.gov uh, website regarding why they released it. Uh, but I thought it would be beneficial rather than jumping into virtual currency entity VCE uh, regulatory bullet points listed here. Let's go right to the guidance itself, walk through it at a high level, and uh, see what we can see. Hopefully, the size uh, of the uh, the writing and whatnot's legible. Um, if uh, for whatever reason you need reference to the material itself, it's available through the DFS website, and this is the actual. Uh, pronouncement itself. Always good to go to the source, uh, even though summaries uh, sometimes skip vital information. Uh, and remember, semantics is everything here. Every word matters. As I mentioned in other quick takes, uh, this language that's being selected by regulators is both an attempt to uh, set some robust and stringent regulatory guidelines, but at the same time deal with the reality of a lot of regulatory uncertainty. So because the regulators are left to provide guidance in largely a regulatory vacuum uh, in virtual currency, uh, the, the review of the language used is even more important um, in this industry than, say, guidance related to other industries where there's a whole you know, tabulation and history of, uh, of rulings and laws around it. Um, so again, I've highlighted some certain things uh, that I think are pertinent. Um, you might find other information. So, uh, but let's get right to it. So the audience for this guidance are, uh, they see this 23NYCRR Part 200, that's code for bit license. So any New York entity that has received a bit license or is a virtual currency entity um, chartered as a limited purpose trust company, again, not a lawyer, just let me caveat that, I'm not a lawyer, not a tax specialist. So any of the stuff here that sounds like legal advice or tax advice, it's not. It's just someone who's experienced in the industry reading stuff like you are. Um, but I do know that in New York, uh, generally speaking, you operate on, under either a bit license or a limited purpose uh, trust company. Um, and in this case, uh, Superintendent Harris is saying this applies to both. Uh, right off the bat, they're, they're describing that the DFS is there to protect customers in the event of insolvency or similar proceedings, something that basically locks up the works so that you as a user of the virtual currency entity uh, service uh, or the customers don't have access, this guidance is meant uh, to further protect and address those users of crypto entities that have experienced insolvency or similar proceeding. Uh, they call out that interest has grown, Virtual currency custody services uh, is growing in retail and institutional customer segments in New York. That's great to see. Uh, and the DFS puts itself out there as being the entity that provided the first comprehensive virtual currency regulatory framework. We're not in a position to challenge that assertion, uh, but they also, you know, rightfully claim that they are the prudential regulator for all virtual currency business activity in New York, and that customer protection is of the utmost important, importance. I will say, as you read through this, every paragraph is about customer protection. It's about customer focused. So if you are a, you run a virtual currency entity, or you're a virtual currency adjacent uh, business, um, or you're a customer looking to do business in New York, uh, recognize that, again, words have meaning. If the DFS is repeating 
that assertion that it's customer protection first, then um, it's safe to assume that they're living by those words. And, and so if you run an operation where there might be some, you know, risk or, or what have you to uh, entities or, or customers in New York, as it relates to virtual currency, know that the, the DFS's mandate is to snuff out those risks. Um, okay. So then it does hear that, you know, DFS places analogous requirements on LPTCs, limited purpose trust companies, uh, as a VCA. So this guidance, and it's only really one page, there's some stuff on the other page, but it's really all here in one page, which also tells you kind of the time frame this was put together. Um, you know, guidance can be short, it can be long, but here this is clearly, uh, folks were mandated within the DFS to put something like this together. Um, they did it, it was reviewed, a uh, holiday break, uh, everyone's back in their chair, a little bit more review, and it gets released now. So this, this, if I had to guess, the impetus for this statement, maybe it was, it's been ideated for some time, but it's clearly in response to um, the bankruptcies and whatnot. Uh, and this gives you a sense of the lag time, right? So if the experience was happening in November, December, um, it takes, at least for this initial guidance, 35, 45, 60 days to really turn something around that's cogent, complete, and, and applicable. Uh, so not instantaneously, but certainly not six months or a year, which is a vast improvement. So the four areas that they talk about here is the requirement of VCEs. Again, that's going to be a virtual uh, currency entity. That's how they, they call it out here, virtual currency entity. Um, there are basically four areas they want to cover, uh, segregating and separating accounts. Um, the, the custodian, you know, the entity holding the virtual currency on behalf of the customers, limited interest in use of virtual currencies, like, uh, you know, just because you hold it doesn't mean you should be playing in the space. Um, they touch on sub-custody arrangements where uh, another service provider might be providing some custody service under the registered uh, custodian. Uh, and then the reminder about disclosures. And someone argue that the disclosure would typically come first, but again, to very important point, the order matters. So the fact that they put accounting first and then interest in custody, uh, you know, the interest in use, using currency second, followed by the subcustody and the disclosure, three and four being probably pretty typical uh, mandates to any financial services company in New York that is using some sort of subservicer that might have control over an asset or uh, uh, an entity where a user needs to see a disclosure. The disclosures and the and the um, the sub arrangements are probably all pretty par for the course. It's one and two which are the most critical in the current environment, and that's why I believe the DFS concentrated on putting them first. So first and foremost, the virtual currency enterprise or entity has to keep books and records that separately account for uh, customers' virtual currency from the corporate assets of the custodian. So hopefully this is common sense, but if you know if you bank at XYZ Bank, the record of your bank account, the amount of money in your account should be separate from the amount of money that XYZ Bank has in the safe. That the it is in, imperative. It's 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 not just prudent, but it it's an obligation, a responsibility of the virtual currency entity that's a custodian to report both on chain and in internal ledger accounts. So if you're using QuickBooks, if you're using Oracle, um, and you're accounting for value uh, or bookkeeping that value off chain, both the off chain record and the on chain. Um, record, um, A, they need to reconcile, but also they should be, they should reflect only the assets of the individual customer um, and not commingle. Um, you have to maintain a clear internal audit trail to identify the virtual currency movements. Um, and uh, the one that I really found interesting was prepared at all times to demonstrate reconciliation between the virtual currency entities, books and records and on-chain activity. So 
that means outside of just ongoing and routine requests, but even more so, um, they're not saying within 72 hours. They're not saying within 24 hours. They're saying at all times. So if you as a virtual currency entity operating you know, under the purview of the NYDFS are requested to provide evidence of a customer's on-chain activity and how it reconciles with the entity's books, you have to be able to provide that near immediately. Um, and then if you can't, obviously there better be a, a, a very cogent and um, supportable uh, reason why. Um, it is Remember that the VC custodian um, is acting on behalf of the customer's holding their assets and we and the the vce and the custodian have to work for the benefit of that customer uh, second bullet limited interest in use of virtual currency so the v this is a great line here the department expects the vc custodian to take position only for the limited purpose of carrying out custody and safekeeping services therefore it will not create a debtor creditor relationship with the customer so if the VCE's business is the custodying and safekeeping of a virtual asset, that's the extent of the service that should be provided and that uh, there's no function uh, that would create a debtor-creditor relationship between the custodian and the customer. So it would be like, for instance, when you deposit, um, you know, let's say stock uh, at, at Merrill Lynch. And again, not a lawyer, but I'm guessing this is the analogy. So let's say you have McDonald's stock, you have it at Merrill Lynch. Um, they're holding on to it. They're custodying it. Merrill Lynch then either allowing you to lever against it. Well, that's probably a different legal entity that's actually performing that task. So the it may all seem like Merrill Lynch when you go to the website, but the reality is, is if you try to margin your equity, it's probably happening in like almost a separate legal entity that the custody or the holding of the asset, um, that relationship with you, the customer, is, is separate than the entity that's actually working to help support the creation of a debtor creditor relationship if requested. But under no circumstances does the DFS want the custodian to create that relationship. Um, the custodian right here should treat the, the customer virtual currency as belonging solely to the customer um, and not employ customer virtual currency for the custodian's own use. So the custodian should not be taking the stuff that's under custody and then going off and doing something with it. Uh, I'm gonna speak anecdotally and off the record here, but, uh, I recall, and, and, and again, I'm, I, I want to be careful how I tread here, but my understanding was part of the way that uh, BlockFi was able to offer um, you know, fairly advantageous rates to its customers that were borrowing against uh, Bitcoin was that they had a side letter agreement with Gemini, who was providing custody services, whereby BlockFi's borrowers who were surrendering their security interest, the Bitcoin, to this Gemini custody account, that somehow Gemini was able to use the Bitcoin in that custodian account to cover short trades. And so in essence, as loans needed to, you know, if there's a big run on BlockFi liquidations or there's a large payback, that there is that case, there is that possibility that the Bitcoin just does not exist, that the Bitcoin is not at the custodian. It has now gone to the ether and um, some other process would have to be held. What the DFS is saying here is that that kind of relationship does not work. That if you're you're a custodian, your job is to custody, and that um, their job is not to create, uh, you know, to use the the, the assets that, that are being held in custody to create a debtor creditor relationship, or 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 use it for their own purposes, such as the custodian using customer assets to secure financing. So. It, it's very clear here that what the DFS is saying is if you are a custodian, um, bit license, limited purpose trust company, your job is to provide custodial services and safekeeping. Um, any other services, you know, that can happen outside of the custodial relationship. Um, but it's it's very cut and dry that they, they want to make sure that the custodian knows that their job is to custody stuff. Um, 
the sub custody arrangements, very interesting here. So here custodians can arrange for the safekeeping of virtual currency through a sub custodian, makes perfect sense. Um, but that the establishment of that custody, sub custody arrangement is something that, that requires approval. It might be a business plan approval, that that uh, the the, um, the review of the, um, the, the the risk assessment of the the sub custodian or service all has to be demonstrated to the DFS uh, for you to engage that sub custodian either at inception or if down the road you add that piece. Uh, but the VC the, the the DFS wants to see uh, the the service agreement. They want to see the, the custodian's updated policies and procedures reflecting how they're going to work with the sub-custodian. Um, and then, of course, the risk assessment. All doable. All you know, Nothing in here is, is onerous or out of the norm for traditional finance companies. This is the, the DFS's way of sort of uh, reiterating, because I'm sure this is already disclosed to the virtual currency entities. So this is kind of the DFS's way of sort of promoting maybe to the general public, like, hey, these rules exist in case you didn't know, but then also a reminder to the virtual currency entities that are in custody services that you need to do this in order to serve uh, our customers because the DFS is going to do whatever it takes to protect New York customers. Um, last piece is the disclosure, right? So the custodian is expected to clearly disclose to each customer in writing terms and conditions associated with the products, services, and the activities, um, and obtain acknowledgement. Let me highlight that here. Obtain acknowledgement of receipt of such disclosure prior to entering into an initial transaction. Um, this is very important. So uh, something similar exists with the GDPR rules on privacy. Like when, when you are prompted at a, you know, through a website, like have you do you understand these terms and conditions? Uh, and you are prompted to like select a checkbox to show your acknowledgement and that you understand it. Um, Pre-filled checkboxes are not allowed. Um, Pop-ups, which just X out, are not allowed. Uh, the, the, the guidance requires active participation on the part of the user that they are communicating, you know, via the site and the, the record of their checkbox, that they acknowledge and they understand um, and then also here, as just a reminder, the custodian should disclose how it segregates and accounts for customer virtual currency. So it's not enough for the custodian to say, hey, we segregate your assets from everyone else's, and that's what we're mandated to do, and, and we do it. It's actually asking for a disclosure on the how, so that the user can then make the judgment themselves, hey, does this uh, layer of segregation, um, you know, does, does it give me the warm fuzzies? Am, am I comfortable with it? So again, uh, very important that this is an important re reminder for virtual currency entities that disclosures have to be prominent, they have to be prevalent, and there needs to be an active uh, selection of, uh, of that acknowledgement uh, through the work process. Uh, here's some footnotes. It's available in the article on where uh, a lot of the information was drawn from. Um, and uh, that about covers it. So again, coming on the heels of some of the insolvency issues uh, in the crypto industry in the winter, this very straightforward, succinct kudos to the DFS for keeping it succinct and high level have provided this overview of expectations for virtual currency service providers, uh, segregation and separate accounting, uh, limited interest in use of the customer's virtual currency on the part of the custodian, sub custody arrangement matters of import, and of course, customer disclosures. So again, uh, if there are any questions, uh, come join us, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I'm Howard Krieger, CEO of Unfederal Reserve. We have an active Telegram and Discord community. You can leave questions in the comments here. Uh, and um, look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks again for your time. Bye. Tell your number to the entire audience so everyone will know when I get it right. But don't worry, Howard. I won't hear you because my eyes are closed. <laughs> 35. All right, Howard. 
I will now read your mind. Concentrate on your number and send it to me with your thought waves. <laughs> Howard, you can, don't hurt yourself, Howard. <laughs> you, can, you can concentrate better if you place your hands on the side of your head. Can you put your hands on your head like you're concentrating? Yes, good, good. Now make your fingers into a little antenna so you can transmit the number. Yes, Howard. Oh, and I like that. That scrunchy, concentrating face. That's good, too. That's good. <laughs> concentrate, Howard. Like orange juice, concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> now say the magic words, which are oogly, shaboogly, manoogly. Oogly, shaboogly, manoogly. Yeah.